I'm a big fan of intros. I like anything that presents itself as an introductory text or episode or chapter or analysis. I like episode zeros. I like chapter zeros. I like preludes. I like prefaces. I like preambles, as maybe you've noticed. And especially recently, I've had the chance to read not a lot of books, but <laughs> a lot of prefaces to books, a lot of chapter zeros, a lot of introductions to books, specifically with a couple of Shakespeare books that I have. They usually have introductory analyses or histories of whatever play uh, I happen to be reading. And especially the older the text, the better the introduction becomes, so that when you read something like um, John Milton's Paradise Lost, you get this massive essay that's like 50 pages long or something. Um, and it's a pleasure to read because it's clearly written by a scholar in that particular text. It's written by an absolute expert who's dedicated most of his life to this one particular text, or maybe, you know, in conjunction with other texts of its kind. And you might think, you know, Louis C.K. has this joke where he says, uh, the, the dumbest people are the people who have three PhDs because they have spent their entire lives thinking about three things, right? And maybe, maybe you could say something similar for people who... Uh, write introductions to Shakespeare plays and early modern English poetry, but but I, I think they're very charming all the same. Today we have the introduction of a much more recent book called Maps of Meaning by Dr. Jordan B. Peterson, subtitled The Architecture of Belief. Neither of those titles are very good. <laughs> Maps of Meaning, The Architecture of Belief. They don't really, you know, spell out what the book is actually about. But the preface of this book is not about either maps of meaning, nor about an architecture of belief, but rather it's about the third bit of text on the title here, which is Jordan B. Peterson. It's about the author. It's sort of a small autobiography. And I wanted to read that because obviously I've read Jordan Peterson's um, second book, 12 Rules for Life, here on this channel. And you can go look that up if you haven't already listened to it. The gimmick there is that I follow every single sentence with a Hail Hydra, uh, because of the joke that he apparently is Red Skull. That's what, you know, he. that's how he was labeled by certain uh, political opponents of his, let's say. Now, one thing that was lacking in that reading is an understanding of who Jordan B. Peterson actually is. What does the P stand for, by the way? Jordan B. Peterson. The P has to stand for something. We don't really understand who he is in that specific text, we, but we get a rundown of his ideas in a much more simplified form than he writes in Maps of Meaning, the Architecture of Belief. So I wanted to read this preface, this mini-autobiography, as it were, to sort of introduce people to who Jordan B. P. Terson is. And I did say in my 12 Rules for Life audiobook, the Hail Hydra edition, that I would have a sort of intermission between Rule 6 and Rule 7, just to give you guys a sort of break from the Hail Hydra-ing. And I think this preface is a nice way to do that. So, I hope you guys enjoy. This is going to be quite a long read. But I think it gives you a good understanding of who this person is and how he grew up and why he believes some of the things he does and what led him to pursue these specific modes of observation that he now suggests is the most valuable way to look at life. Okay. So, let's dive in to the preface, which is titled... Descensus ad inferos, which I think means descent to hell, but take that with a grain of salt. <clears throat> something we cannot see protects us from something we do not understand. The thing we cannot see is culture in its intra-psychic or internal manifestation. The thing we do not understand is the chaos that gave rise to culture. If the structure of culture is disrupted unwittingly, chaos returns. We will do anything, anything, to defend ourselves against that return. There's a quote here, but it doesn't actually say where it's from. It goes like this. The very fact that a general problem has gripped and assimilated the whole of a person is a guarantee that the speaker has really experienced it and perhaps gained something from his sufferings. He will then reflect the problem for us in his personal life and thereby show us a truth. End quote. I was raised under the protective auspices, so to speak, of the Christian church. This does not mean that my family was explicitly religious. I attended conservative Protestant services during childhood with my mother, but she was not a dogmatic or authoritarian believer, and we never discussed religious issues at home. 
My father appeared essentially agnostic, at least in the traditional sense. He refused to even set foot in a church, except during weddings and funerals. Nonetheless, the historical remnants of Christian morality permeated our household, conditioning our expectations and interpersonal responses in the most intimate of manners. When I grew up, after all, most people still attended church. Furthermore, all the rules and expectations that made up middle-class society were Judeo-Christian in nature. Even the increasing number of those who could not tolerate formal ritual and belief still implicitly accepted, still acted out, the rules that made up the Christian game. When I was 12 or so, my mother enrolled me in confirmation classes, which served as introduction to adult membership in the church. I did not like attending. I did not like the attitude of my overly, overtly religious classmates, who were few in number, and did not desire their lack of social standing. I did not like the school-like atmosphere of the confirmation classes. More importantly, however, I could not swallow what I was being taught. I asked the minister, at one point, how he reconciled the story of Genesis with the creation theories of modern science. He had not undertaken such a reconciliation. Furthermore, he seemed more convinced, in his heart, of the evolutionary viewpoint. I was looking for an excuse to leave anyway, and that was the last straw. Religion was for the ignorant, weak, and superstitious. I stopped attending church and joined the modern world. Although I had grown up in a Christian environment and had a successful and happy childhood, in at least partial consequence, I was more than willing to throw aside the structure that had fostered me. No one really opposed my rebellious efforts either, in church or at home, in part because those who were deeply religious, or who might have wanted to be, had no intellectually acceptable counter-arguments at their disposal. After all, many of the basic tenets of Christian belief were incomprehensible, if not clearly absurd, The virgin birth was an impossibility. Likewise, the notion that someone could rise from the dead. Did my act of rebellion precipitate a familial or a social crisis? No. My actions were so predictable, in a sense, that they upset no one, with the exception of my mother, and even she was soon resigned to the inevitable. The other members of the church, my community, had become absolutely habituated to the increasingly more frequent act of defection, and did not even notice. Did my act of rebellion upset me personally? Only in a manner I was not able to perceive until many years later. I developed a premature concern with large-scale political and social issues at about the time I quit attending church. Why were some countries, some people, rich, happy, and successful, while others were doomed to misery? Why almost dropped the book? Why were the forces of NATO and the Soviet Union continually at each other's throats? How was it possible for people to act the way the Nazis had during World War II? Underlying these specific considerations was a broader, but at the time ill-conceptualized question: How did evil, particularly group-fostered evil, come to play its role in the world? I abandoned the traditions that supported me at about the same time I left childhood. This meant that I had no broader socially constructed philosophy at hand to aid my understanding as I became aware of the existential problems that accompany maturity. The final consequences of that privation took years to become fully manifest. In the meantime, however, my nascent concern with questions of moral justice found immediate resolution. I started working as a volunteer for a mildly socialist political party and adopted the party line. That's the NDP, by the way, here in Alberta. That's definitely the NDP. Economic injustice was at the root of all evil, as far as I was concerned. Such injustice could be rectified as a consequence of the rearrangement of social organizations. I could play a part in that admirable revolution, carrying out my ideological beliefs. Doubt vanished. My role was clear. Looking back, I am amazed at how stereotypical my actions, reactions, really were. I could not rationally accept the premises of religion as I understood them. I turned in consequence to dreams of political utopia and personal power. The same ideological trap caught millions of others in recent centuries. When I was 17, I left the town I grew up in. I moved nearby and attended a small college which offered the first two years of undergraduate education. 
I involved myself there in university politics, which were more or less left-wing at that time, and was elected to the College Board of Governors. What the hell? The, hmm. the board was composed of politically and ideologically conservative people, lawyers, doctors, businessmen. They were all well, or at least practically, educated, pragmatic, confident, outspoken. They had all accomplished something worthwhile and difficult. I could not help but admire them even though I did not share their political stance. I found the fact of my admiration unsettling. I had attended several left-wing party congresses as a student politician and active party worker. I hoped to emulate the socialist leaders. The left had a long and honourable history in Canada and attracted some truly competent and caring people. However, I could not generate much respect for the numerous low-level party activists I encountered at these meetings. They seemed to live to complain. They had no career frequently and no family, no completed education, nothing but ideology. They were peevish, irritable, and little in every sense of the word. I was faced in consequence with the mirror image of the problem I encountered on the college board. I did not admire many of the individuals who believed the same things I did. This additional complication furthered my existential confusion. My college roommate, an insightful cynic, expressed skepticism regarding my ideological beliefs. He told me that the world could not be completely encapsulated within the boundaries of socialist philosophy. Or any philosophy for that matter. What's it that Hamlet says to Horatio again? <laughs> I had more or less come to this conclusion on my own, but had not admitted so much in words. Soon afterward, however, I read George Orwell's Road to Wigan Pier. Well, this book finally undermined me, not only my socialist ideology, but my faith in ideological stances themselves. In the famous essay concluding that book, written for, and much to the dismay of, the British Left Book Club, Orwell described the great flaw of socialism and the reason for its frequent failure to attract and maintain democratic power, at least in Britain. Orwell said, essentially, that socialists did not really like the poor, they merely hated the rich. His idea struck home instantly. Socialist ideology served to mask resentment and hatred, bred by failure. Many of the party activists I had encountered were using the ideals of social justice to rationalize their pursuit of personal revenge. Whose fault was it that I was poor or uneducated and unadmired? Obviously the fault of the rich, well-schooled and respected. How convenient then that the demands of revenge and abstract justice dovetailed. It was only right to obtain recompense from those more fortunate than me. Of course, my socialist colleagues and I weren't out to hurt anyone. Quite the reverse, we were out to improve things, but we were going to start with other people. I came to see the temptation in this logic, the obvious flaw, the danger, but could also see that it did not exclusively characterize socialism. Anyone who was out to change the world by changing others was to be regarded with suspicion. The temptations of such a position were too great to be resisted. It's funny how nearly all of the great conservative thinkers that we think of today and started out as socialists. The other one that significantly comes to mind is Thomas Sowell, who I intend to still read on this channel someday. Um, and he started out as a full-on Marxist. And he actually studied under uh, Milton Friedman, who is like the champion of capitalist e uh, e economics. Um, and still, he retained his Marxism until one day he decided to work for the government and he realized, good God, this is a complete shambles. There is no way the government could ever be able to enforce a successful strategy to redistribute the wealth. <laughs> and that's how he became disillusioned ultimately with Marxism. It's the sheer dysfunctionality of government as such. <laughs> anyway, returning to J.B. Peterson here. Still don't know what the P stands for. It was not socialist ideology that posed the problem then, but ideology as such. Ideology divided the world up simplistically into those who thought and acted properly, and those who did not. Ideology enabled the believer to hide from his own unpleasant and inadmissible fantasies and wishes. Such realizations upset my beliefs, even my faith in beliefs. 
and the plans I had formulated as a consequence of these beliefs. I could no longer tell who was good and who was bad, so to speak, so I no longer knew whom to support or whom to fight. This state of affairs proved very troublesome, pragmatically as well as philosophically. I wanted to become a corporate lawyer, had written the law school admissions test, had taken two years of appropriate preliminary courses. I wanted to learn the ways of my enemies and embark on a political career. Well, this plan disintegrated. The world obviously did not need another lawyer, and I no longer believed, <laughs> and I no longer believed that I knew enough to masquerade as a leader. Very humble. I became simult in, in um, Chronicles of Narnia. The second book that Lewis released is called Prince Caspian. And in it, at the end of the journey, the tyrant king Miraz is slain. And Aslan, who's sort of the god of the realm. Why am I explaining Narnia to you guys? You know who Aslan is. Aslan comes down and says, Caspian, are you ready to be king? And Caspian says, no. And Aslan replies, that's how I know you're ready to be king. That sense of humility is the most necessary thing, perhaps, to be a leader. <clears throat> I became simultaneously disenchanted with the study of political science, my erstwhile major. I had adopted that discipline so I could learn more about the structure of human beliefs, and for the practical, career-oriented reasons described previously. It remained very interesting to me when I was at junior college, where I was introduced to the history of political philosophy. When I moved to the main campus at the University of Alberta, however, my interest disappeared. I was taught that people were motivated by rational forces, that human beliefs and actions were determined by economic pressures. This did not seem sufficient explanation. I could not believe, and still do not, that commodities, natural resources for example, had intrinsic and self-evident value. When the absence of such value, the worth of things had to be socially or culturally or even individually determined. This act of determination appeared to me moral, appeared to me to be a consequence of the moral philosophy adopted by the society, culture, or person in question. What people valued economically merely reflected what they believed to be important. This meant that real motivation had to lie in the domain of value, of morality. The political scientists I studied with did not see this, or did not think it was relevant. My religious convictions, ill-formed to begin with, disappeared when I was very young. My confidence in socialism, that is, in political utopia, vanished when I realized that the world was not merely a place of economics. My faith in ideology departed when I began to see that ideological identification itself posed a profound and mysterious problem. I could not accept the theoretical explanations my chosen field of study had to offer, and no longer had any practical reasons to continue in my original direction. I finished my three-year bachelor's degree and left university. All my beliefs which had lent order to the chaos of my existence, at least temporarily, had proved illusory. I could no longer see the sense in things. I was cast adrift. I did not know what to do or what to think. I have a poem that starts with those exact words. <laughs> but what of others? Was there evidence anywhere that the problems I now faced had been solved by anyone in any acceptable manner? The customary behavior and attitudes of my friends and family members offered no solution. The people I knew well were no more resolutely goal-directed or satisfied than I was. Their beliefs and modes of being seemed merely to disguise frequent doubt and profound disquietude. More disturbingly, on the more general plane, something truly insane was taking place. The great societies of the world were feverishly constructing a nuclear machine with unimaginably destructive capabilities. Someone or something was making terrible plans. Why? Theoretically normal and well-adapted people were going about their business prosaically as if nothing were the matter. Why weren't they disturbed? Weren't they paying attention? Wasn't I? My concern with the general social and political insanity and evil of the world sublimated by temporary infatuation with utopian socialism and political machination, returned with a vengeance. 
The mysterious fact of the Cold War increasingly occupied the forefront of my consciousness. How could things have come to such a point? History, he, he quotes a poem here. History is just a madhouse. It's turned over all the stones, and its very careful reading leaves you little that's unknown. I could not understand the nuclear race. What could possibly be worth risking annihilation? Not merely of the present, but of the past and the future. What could possibly justify the threat of total destruction? Bereft of solutions, I had at least been granted the gift of a problem. I returned to university and began to study psychology. I visited a maximum security prison on the outskirts of Edmonton under the supervision of an eccentric adjunct professor at the University of Alberta. His primary job was the psychological care of convicts. The prison was full of murderers, rapists, armed robbers. I ended up in the jail. <laughs> Reminds me of a Norm MacDonald joke about him. He was invited to perform at a hospital. But when he got there, he realized it was a hospital for the criminally insane. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> anyway, I ended up in the gym near the weight room on my first reconnaissance. I was wearing a long wool cape, circa 1890, which I had bought in Portugal and a pair of tall leather boots. Goodness gracious, he was dressed like a RuneScape character. The psychologist who was accompanying me disappeared unexpectedly and left me alone. Soon I was surrounded by unfamiliar men, some of whom were extremely large and tough looking. One in particular stands out in my memory. He was exceptionally muscular and tattooed over his bare chest. He had a vicious scar running from his collarbone to his midsection. Maybe he had survived open-heart injury, or maybe it was an axe wound. The injury would have killed a lesser man anyway, someone like me. Some of the prisoners, who weren't dressed particularly well, offered to trade their clothes for mine. This did not strike me as a great bargain, but I wasn't sure how to refuse. Fate rescued me in the, in the form of a short, skinny, bearded man. He said that the psychologist had sent him, and he asked me to accompany him. He was only one person, and many others, much larger, currently surrounded me and my cape. So, so I took him at his word. He led me outside the gym doors and into the prison yard, talking quietly but reasonably about something innocuous, I don't recall what, all the while. I kept glancing back, hopefully, at the open doors behind us as we got further and further away, and finally my supervisor appeared and motioned me back. We left the bearded prisoner and went to a private office. The psychologist told me that the harmless-appearing little man who had escorted me out of the gym had murdered two policemen after he had forced them to dig their own graves. One of the policemen had little children and had begged for his life on their behalf while he was digging at least according to the murderer's own testimony. This really shocked me. I had read about this sort of event, of course, but it had never been made real for me. I had never met someone even tangentially affected by something like this, and had certainly not encountered anyone who had actually done something so terrible. How could the man I had talked to, who was apparently normal and so seemingly inconsequential, have done such an awful thing. Some of the courses I was attending at this time were taught in large lecture theatres where the students were seated in descending rows, row after row. In one of these courses, Introduction to Clinical Psychology, appropriately enough, I think that's, I'm pretty sure this is one of the courses he used to teach at the University of Toronto uh, uh, until he stopped teaching. I experienced a recurrent compulsion. I would take my seat behind some unwitting individual and listen to the professor speak. At some point during the lecture, I would unfailingly feel the urge to stab the point of my pen into the neck of the person in front of me. This impulse was not overwhelming, luckily, but it, <laughs> luckily, but it was powerful enough to disturb me. What sort of terrible person would have an impulse like that? Not me. I had never been aggressive. I had been smaller and younger than my classmates for most of my life. Uh, and I think he was bullied as well, so... Gives you more of a perspective on what aggression means to him. Or no, no, he was the bully. He was a small little wiry bully. I remember this from my readings of uh, 12 Rules for Life. <laughs> 
So aggression probably never meant physical aggression to him. That's what I'm trying to get at. I went back to the prison a month or so after my first visit. During my absence, two prisoners had attacked a third, a suspected informer. They held or tied him down and pulverized one of his legs with a lead pipe. I was taken aback once again, but this time I tried something different. I tried to imagine, really imagine, what I would have to be like to do such a thing. I concentrated on this task for days and days and experienced a frightening revelation. The truly appalling aspect of such atrocity did not lie in its impossibility or remoteness, as I had naively assumed, but in its ease. I was not much different from the violent prisoners, not qualitatively different. I could do what they could do, although I hadn't. This discovery truly upset me. I was not who I thought I was. Surprisingly, however, the desire to stab someone with my pen disappeared. In retrospect, I would say that the behavioral urge had manifested itself in explicit knowledge, had been translated from emotion and image to concrete realization, and had no further reason to exist. The impulse had only occurred because of the question I was attempting to answer. How can men do terrible things to one another? Well, I meant other men, of course. Bad men. But I had still asked the question. There was no reason for me to assume that I would receive a predictable or personally meaningless answer. At the same time, something odd was happening to my ability to converse. I had always enjoyed engaging in arguments, regardless of topic. I regarded them as a sort of game, not that this is in any way unique. Suddenly, however, I couldn't talk. More accurately, I couldn't stand listening to myself talk. I started to hear a voice inside my head, commenting on my opinions. Every time I said something, it said something, something critical. The voice employed a standard refrain, delivered in a somewhat bored and matter-of-fact tone, which I will now try my best to perform. <clears throat> you don't believe that. That isn't true. You don't believe that. That isn't true. How is that for bored and matter-of-fact? I'm not a very bored and or matter-of-fact person, so that's probably the hardest voice for me to do. Anyway, the voice applied such comments to almost every phrase I spoke. You don't believe that? That isn't true. I couldn't understand what to make of this. I knew the source of the commentary was part of me, but this knowledge only increased my confusion. Which part precisely was me? The talking part or the criticizing part? If it was the talking part, then, then how could I criticize myself? What was the criticizing part? If it was the criticizing part, well then, how could virtually everything I said be untrue? In my ignorance and confusion, I decided to experiment. I tried only to say things that my internal reviewer would pass unchallenged. This meant that I really had to listen to what I was saying, that I spoke much less often, and that I would frequently stop midway through a sentence, feel embarrassed, and reformulate my thoughts. I soon noticed that I felt much less agitated and more confident when I only said things that the voice did not object to. This came as a definite relief. My experiment had been a success. I was the criticizing part. Nonetheless, it took me a long time to reconcile myself to the idea that almost all my thoughts weren't real, weren't true, or at least weren't mine. All the things I believed were things I thought sounded good, admirable, respectable, courageous. They weren't my things, however. I had stolen them. Most of them I had taken from books. Having understood them abstractly, I presumed I had a right to them, presumed that I could adopt them as if they were mine, presumed that they were me. My head was stuffed full of the ideas of others, stuffed full of arguments I could not logically refute. I did not know then that an irrefutable argument is not necessarily true, nor that the right to identify with certain ideas has to be earned. I read something by Carl Jung at about this time that helped me understand what I was experiencing. It was Jung who formulated the concept of persona, the mask that feigned individuality. Adoption of such a mask, according to Jung, allowed each of us and those around us to believe that we were authentic. 
Jung said, When we analyze the persona, we strip off the mask and discover that what seemed to be individual is at bottom collective. In other words, that the persona was only a mask of the collective psyche. Fundamentally, the persona is nothing real. It is a compromise between individual and society as to what a man should appear to be. It is a comp- Do I understand that? Fundamentally, the persona is nothing real. It is a compromise between individual and society as to what a man should appear to be. Yes, I do. Okay. He takes a name, earns a title, exercises a function. He is this or that. In a certain sense, all this is real. Yet, in relation to the essential individuality of the person concerned, it is only a secondary reality, a compromise formation, in making which others often have a greater share than he. The persona is a semblance, a two-dimensional reality, to give it a nickname. Despite my verbal facility, I was not real. I found this painful to admit. I began to dream almost unbearable dreams. My dream life up to this point had been relatively uneventful, as far as I can remember. Furthermore, I have never had a particularly good visual imagination. Nonetheless, my dreams became so horrible and so emotionally gripping that I was often afraid to go to sleep. I dreamt dreams, vivid as reality. I could not escape from them or ignore them. They circulated in general around a single theme, that of nuclear war and total devastation, around the worst evils that I or something in me could imagine. And he describes here, I think, one of the dreams that he had. It's all in italics, so I assume that's what it is. My parents lived in a standard ranch-style house in a middle-class neighborhood in a small town in northern Alberta. I was sitting in the darkened basement of this house in the family room watching TV with my cousin Diane, who was, in truth, in waking life, the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. A newscaster suddenly interrupted the program. The television picture and sound distorted, and static filled the screen. Diane stood up and went behind the TV to check the electrical cord. She touched it and started convulsing and frothing at the mouth, frozen upright by intense current. A brilliant flash of light from a small window flooded the basement. I rushed upstairs. There was nothing left of the ground floor of the house. It had been completely and cleanly sheared away, leaving only the floor, which now served the basement as a roof. Red and orange flames filled the sky from horizon to horizon. Nothing was left as far as I could see, except skeletal black ruins sticking up here and there. No houses, no trees, no signs of other human beings or of any life whatsoever. The entire town and everything that surrounded it on the flat prairie had been completely obliterated. It started to rain mud. Heavily, the mud blotted out everything and left the earth brown, wet, flat and dull, and the sky leaden, even grey. A few distraught and shell-shocked people started to gather together. They were carrying unlabeled and dented cans of food which contained nothing but mush and vegetables. They stood in the mud looking exhausted and dishevelled. Some dogs emerged, out from under the basement stairs where they had inexplicably taken residence. They were standing upright on their hind legs. They were thin, like greyhounds, and had pointed noses. They looked like creatures of ritual, like Anubis from the Egyptian tombs. They were carrying plates in front of them which contained pieces of seared meat. They wanted to trade the meat for the cans. I took a plate. In the center of it was a circular slab of flesh, four inches in diameter and one inch thick, foully cooked, oily, with a marrow bone in the center of it. Where did it come from? I had a terrible thought. I rushed downstairs to Diane. The dogs had butchered her and were offering the meat to the survivors of the disaster. Yowza! I dreamed apocalyptic dreams of this intensity two or three times a week for a year or more while I attended university classes and worked, as if nothing out of the ordinary was going on in my mind. Something I had no familiarity with was happening, however. I was being affected simultaneously by events on two planes. On the first plane were the normal, predictable, everyday occurrences that I shared with everybody else. On the second plane, however... Unique to me, or so I thought. 
existed dreadful images and unbearably intense emotional states. This idiosyncratic, subjective world, which everyone normally treated as illusory, seemed to me at that time to lie somehow behind the world everyone knew and regarded as real. But what did real mean? The closer I looked, the less comprehensible things became. Where was the real? What was at the bottom of it all? I did not feel I could live without knowing. My interest in the Cold War transformed itself into a true obsession. I thought about the suicidal and murderous preparation of that war every minute of every day from the moment I woke up until the second I went to bed. How could such a state of affairs come about? Who was responsible? I dreamed that I was running through a mall parking lot, trying to escape from something. I was running through the parked cars, opening one door, crawling across the front seat, opening the other, moving to the next. The doors on one car suddenly slammed shut. I was in the passenger seat. The car started to move by itself. A voice said harshly, There is no way out of here. I was on a journey. Going somewhere. I did not want to go. I was not the driver. I became very depressed and anxious. I had vaguely suicidal thoughts, but mostly wished that everything would just go away. I wanted to lie down on my couch and sink into it, literally, until only my nose was showing, like the snorkel of a diver above the surface of the water. I found my awareness of things unbearable. I came home late one night from a college drinking party, self-disgusted and angry. I took a canvas board and some paints. I sketched a harsh, crude picture of a crucified Christ, glaring and demonic, with a cobra wrapped around his naked waist like a belt. The picture disturbed me, struck me despite my agnosticism as sacrilegious. I did not know what it meant, however, or why I had painted it. Where in the world had it come from? I hadn't paid any attention to religious ideas for years. I hid the painting under some old clothes in my closet and sat cross-legged on the floor. I put my head down. It became obvious to me at that moment that I had not developed any real understanding of myself or of others. Everything I had once believed about the nature of society and myself had proved false. The world had apparently gone insane and something strange and frightening was happening in my head. James Joyce said, History is a nightmare from which I am trying to awake. For me, history literally was a nightmare. I wanted above all else at that moment to wake up and make my terrible dreams go away. I have been trying ever since then to make sense of the human capacity, my capacity for evil, particularly for those evils associated with belief. I started by trying to make sense of my dreams. I couldn't ignore I couldn't ignore them, after all. Perhaps they were trying to tell me something. I had nothing to lose by admitting the possibility. I read Freud's interpretation of dreams and found it useful. Freud at least took the topic seriously, but I could not regard my nightmares as wish fulfillment. Furthermore, they seemed more religious than sexual in nature. I knew, vaguely, that Jung had developed specialized knowledge of myth and religion, so I started through his writings. His thinking was granted little credence by the academics I knew, but they weren't particularly concerned with dreams. I couldn't help being concerned by mine. They were so intense I thought they might derange me. What was the alternative? To believe that the terrors and the pains they caused me were not real? Much of the time I could not understand what Jung was getting at. He was making a point I could not grasp, speaking a language I did not comprehend. Now and then, however, his statement struck home. He offered this observation, for example... It must be admitted that the archetypal contents of the collective unconscious can often assume grotesque and horrible forms in dreams and fantasies, so that even the most hard-boiled rationalist is not immune from shattering nightmares and haunting fears. End quote. The second part of that statement certainly seemed applicable to me, although the first, the archetypal contents of the collective unconscious, etc., remained mysterious and obscure. Still, this was promising. Jung at least recognized that the things that were happening to me could happen. Furthermore, he offered some hints as to their cause. So I kept reading. I soon came across this following hypothesis. Here was a potential solution to the problems I was facing, or at least the description of a place to look for such a solution. 
The psychological elucidation of dream and fantasy images, which cannot be passed over in silence or blindly ignored, leads logically into the depths of religious phenomenology. The history of religion in its widest sense, including therefore mythology, folklore, and primitive psychology, is a treasure house of archetypal forms from which the doctor can draw helpful parallels and enlightening comparisons for the purpose of calming and clarifying a consciousness that is all at sea. It is absolutely necessary to supply these fantastic images that rise up so strange and threatening before the mind's eye with some kind of context so as to make them more intelligible. Experience has shown that the best way to do this is by means of comparative mythological material. And by experience, Jung means there literally his own experience. This is what he developed as a system. Uh, end quote. The study of comparative mythological material in fact made my horrible dreams disappear. The cure wrought by the study, however, was purchased at the price of complete and often painful transformation. What I believe about the world now, and how I act in consequence, is so much at variance with what I believed when I was younger that I might as well be a completely different person. Hashtag relatable, man. I discovered that that's a phrase that no one has ever said to Jordan P. Peterson ever. In person, actually. <laughs> I discovered that beliefs make the world in a very real way, that beliefs are the world in a more than metaphysical sense. The discovery has not turned me into a moral relativist, however. Quite the contrary. I have become convinced that the world that is belief... That's a strange phrase. Let me try that again. I have become convinced that the world that is belief... The... the hmm, I have become convinced that the world that is belief, is orderly, and that there are universal moral absolutes, although these are structured such that a diverse range of human opinion remains both possible and beneficial. I believe that individuals and societies who flout these absolutes, in ignorance or in willful opposition, are doomed to misery and eventual dissolution. I learned that the meanings of the most profound substrata of belief systems can be rendered explicitly comprehensible, even to the skeptical, rational thinker, and that, so rendered, can be experienced as fascinating, profound, and necessary. I learned why people wage war, why the desire to maintain, protect, and expand the domain of belief motivates even the most incomprehensible acts of group-fostered oppression and cruelty and what might be done to ameliorate this tendency, despite its universality. I learned, finally, that the terrible aspect of life might actually be a necessary precondition for the existence of life, and that it is impossible to regard that precondition, in consequence, as comprehensible and acceptable. I hope that I can bring those who read this book to the same conclusions, without demanding any unreasonable suspension of critical judgment accepting that necessary to initially encounter and consider the arguments I present. These can be summarized as follows. And here he changes font, so clearly he's uh, implying some sort of different voice, I suppose. I'm not going to do a different voice because I like my voice. But yes, yeah, so he is just summarizing the book in a nutshell and in a more methodological format, I think. So let's dive into this. <clears throat> the world can be validly construed as a forum for action as well as a place of things. We describe the world as a place of things, using the formal methods of science. The techniques of narrative, however, myth, literature, and drama, portray the world as a forum for action. The two forms of representation have been unnecessarily set at odds because we have not yet formed a clear picture of their respective domains. The domain of the former is the objective world. What is from the perspective of intersubjective perception. The domain of the latter is the world of value, what is and what should be, from the perspective of emotion and action. The world as form for action is composed essentially of three constituent elements, which tend to manifest themselves in typical patterns of metaphoric representation. First is unexplored territory, the great mother, nature, creative and destructive, source and final resting place of all determinate things. Second is explored territory, the great father, culture, protective and tyrannical, cumulative ancestral wisdom. 
Third is the process that mediates between unexplored and explored territory. The Divine Son, the archetypal individual, creative exploratory word, and vengeful adversary. We are adapted to this world of divine character as much as to the objective world. The fact of this adaptation implies that the environment is in reality a form for action, as well as a place of things. Unprotected exposure to unexplored territory produces fear. The individual is protected from such fear as a consequence of ritual imitation of the Great Father, as a consequence of the adoption of group identity which restricts the meaning of things and confers predictability on social interactions. When identification with the group is made absolute, however, when everything has to be controlled, when the unknown is no longer allowed to exist, the creative exploratory process that updates the group can no longer manifest itself. This restriction of adaptive capacity dramatically increases the probability of social aggression. Rejection of the unknown is tantamount to identification with the devil, the mythological counterpart and eternal adversary of the world-creating exploratory hero. Such rejection and identification is a consequence of Luciferian pride, which states all that I know is all that is necessary to know. This pride is totalitarian assumption of omniscience, is adoption of God's place by reason, is something that inevitably generates a state of personal and social being indistinguishable from hell. This hell develops because creative exploration, impossible without humble acknowledgement of the unknown, constitutes the process that constructs and maintains the productive, adaptive structure that gives life much of its acceptable meaning. Identification with the devil amplifies the dangers inherent in group identification, which tends of its own accord toward pathological stultification. Loyalty to personal interest, subjective meaning, can serve as an antidote to the overwhelming temptation constantly posed by the possibility of denying anomaly. Personal interest and subjective meaning reveals itself at the juncture of explored and unexplored territory and is indicative of participation in the process that ensures continued healthy individual and societal adaptation. Loyalty to personal interest is equivalent to identification with the archetypal hero, the savior, who upholds his association with the creative word in the face of death and despite group pressure to conform. Identification with the hero serves to decrease the unbearable motivational valence of the unknown. Furthermore, provides the individual with a standpoint that simultaneously transcends and maintains the group. That's the end of the summary, which was dense as fucking shit, and I didn't understand more than a sentence at a time. (laughs) Um... There is one final paragraph, which let me read very quickly. Similar summaries precede each chapter and subchapter. Read as a unit, they comprise a complete but compressed picture of the book. These should be read first after this preface. In this manner, the whole of the arguments I am offering might come quickly to aid comprehension of the parts. I would fucking hope so, given how ridiculously difficult to understand that whole end bit was. But uh, yeah, with that preface done i can now start reading maps of meaning with hail hydras after every sentence no i'm kidding that's not gonna happen um it's a crazy book this one and i still haven't read it completely i still read it i read it in chunks uh the way i read jung in chunks and then i go what the fuck is this guy talking about and then i close the book and don't open it for another two weeks at a time (laughs) you know so uh So yeah, do I recommend this one? Not unless you've already read 12 Rules for Life and you've already listened to a bunch of his lectures online, which also I recommend, by the way, because they're a lot more conversational and his writing style is so much more stilted than his talking style. So yes, his lectures, definitely go to his lectures first and then come back to this if you're still interested in what he has to say. But besides that, I hope you enjoyed this reading. And if you didn't, then uh, blame it on me. Don't blame it on the book. Not until you've read it. I forget the outro that I used to have for these Jordan Peterson videos. So I'm just going to say, stay mortal, 
Don't be jump scared by death. And I, as the Germans say, Ich liebe zu lesen.